But some of the things that can impair magnesium retention in the body and lead to excess excretion are a high calcium intake. Um, again, we're seeing this uh, affects these effects of calcium and magnesium together. Uh, calcium and magnesium actually use the same transport systems. Again, TRMP6 um, can transport both calcium and magnesium within the kidney. So when you have a high calcium intake, it can actually impair absorption of magnesium, especially when you have a low magnesium intake. <laughs> Uh, two other things that can affect magnesium uh, retention, but also retention of the cations in general, is glucose in the urine, which is present during uncontrolled diabetes. I added this graph at the last minute just kind of to show how this works. Um, when you have any kind of solute in the urine, with glucose being an example, that's unabsorbed, then it increases the solute concentration in the final urine during in a collecting duct. And this decreases the osmotic gradient between the collecting duct and the kidney. So you're actually able to absorb less water and you excrete less water. This is why in uncontrolled diabetes, one of the symptoms is excess urination and extreme thirst. Um, when you have this increased filtration rate, then you're also going to be um, in just increasing the amount of urine produced and you're going to be increasing the amount of the cations that are excreted with magnesium being one of them. Um, Antihypertensive drugs act in a very similar manner to glucose in the urine would. Um, their mechanism of action, how they lower the blood pressure, is they, or at least in loop diuretics cases, they actually inhibit the reabsorption of cations. And what they're primarily targeting with this is to inhibit the absorption of sodium. So it lowers blood sodium and lowers blood volume, which will lower blood pressure. But these loop diuretics also are known as um, extreme magnesium wasters which when we get to the functions of magnesium and hypertension later, you'll see how this is kind of like a paradoxical effect. You wouldn't really want this, but it's still a side effect of these loop diuretics. So now we'll see the osseous function, the functions of magnesium in the bone. So in the bone, mag I usually think calcium and phosphorus, but about 70% of the bone magnesium is present with calcium and phosphorus as part of the crystal lattice structure, the hydroxyapatite, however you say that. And then also about 30% of this bone is, um, or 30% of the magnesium in bone is in the free ionic form and is um, complex with the surface of bone and is equilibri in equilibrium with plasma and magnesium concentrations. And this is actually a really essential um, magnesium pool right here for maintaining plasma equilibrium of magnesium. Like I was saying earlier, magnesium is generally an intracellular cation, so its levels in the blood are pretty low. So when you have any type of stress that affects any type of stress that will cause cellular uptake of magnesium, any small uh, difference that occurs in the plasma magnesium concentrations causes a large relative effect. So you really need to maintain this within a tight level, and that is primarily what this bone surface magnesium is there for. When it's lower, the, mag the bone surface magnesium will release from the bone and maintain it within these plasma equilibrium concentrations. Um, an indirect effect of magnesium, not necessarily on the bone structure itself, but magnesium is also essential to the enzyme which converts D vitamin D2 to the active form of vitamin D, vitamin D3. So indirectly, it's going to affect um, bone health and calcium retention as well. And now for the non osseous functions. This is where magnesium really shines. Um, magnesium is involved in over 300 chemical reactions, so by far more than any other coenzyme or cofactor within the body. I think I saw a recent paper published in 2012 where they're now saying in the introduction 350 enzymes, so I guess this number just keeps rising as they keep finding new enzymes or magnesium as a part of it. Uh, and the main role is of magnesium is in substrate neutralization. So it's in neutralization of anionic charges within substrates via chelation. So a simple definition of chelation is just it's the formation of two or more coordinate covalent bonds between a ligand such as ATP, which is shown here, and a single atom, which is magnesium. And this forms a ring structure. Uh, this ring structure formation alters both the charge of the substrate and also the um, structure of the substrate. And this has important effects when we look at enzyme structure and function. 
So as I showed in the last slide, I used magnesium ATP as an example, because this is really what magnesium's primary role within the body is. So ATP must be bound to magnesium for biological activity. So that's something important to remember. It must be bound to ATP. So this role is so important within the body, actually, that about 80% of the intracellular magnesium is associated with ATP at any given time. Um, and this is, magnesium is essential for ATP's biological activity because it aids in the transfer of the phosphate, or in phosphate transfer reaction in kinases and phosphatases. So here's an example of one of those reactions. Uh, this is actually hexokinase, which is the first step of glycolysis. Uh, it involves the transfer of glucose um, the phosphate of ATP to glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate and ADP. Uh, going back to a little bit of OCHEM here. Um, so this reaction, basically the reaction mechanism is the nucleophile oxygen on glucose. Um, the nucleophilically attacks the phosphate of the gamma phosphate of ATP. So it's a backside attack, if you remember if you were in Dr. Berg's lecture at any time. And, um, Really, why magnesium is important here is because in order for a nucleophile to attack electrophile, which you, if you remember that at all, um, electrophiles they need to want, they need to be attracted to these electrons. Uh, phosphate is usually extremely negative due to the oxygens, so it's not going to really want to attract electrons at this point. Um, when you have magnesium, magnesium actually pulls away some of that negative charge from that gamma phosphate to make it a little more attractive to the uh, glucose, to the um, hydroxyl group on glucose. In addition to substrate neutralization, the other function of um, magnesium is also in enzyme stabilization. So magnesium is not only essential to the uh, activity of substrates in these enzymatic reactions, but also is essential to the enzymes themselves. Uh, magnesium what it, it either binds into the active site and holds the active site in a certain conformation, or it also is essential to binding cofactors or coenzymes within the active site as well. Uh, two examples of enzymes which need magnesium for their stabilization or active site are creatine kinase and the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So I was trying to look for a diagram that can actually explain this online, but it was just a whole bunch of fallen stick figures which didn't really make sense and it's kind of hard to explain it off of, so I used my amazing PowerPoint skills to make an active site of E1. Uh, so this is the E1 active site here, um, and without magnesium, thiamine pyrophosphate, which we have to go back to the very first part of this lecture, cannot bind into the active site of E1. And if you remember, thiamine pyrophosphate is essential for the decarboxylation reaction or the pulling of that um, CO2 group <coughs> off of pyruvate, which is the first step of this reaction. So when magnesium is present it, within the E1 active complex, it actually chelates again <coughs> the two phosphates on the end of TPP and holds it within the active site so that the active site can now carry out its function of the E1 complex, which is the full carbon, um, carbon dioxide off of pyruvate. And with, uh, like I covered earlier, um, this is actually a sister enzyme to the uh, French chain dehydrogenase complex and also to the um, glutamate dehydrogenase complex. So any of these dehydrogenases will all require magnesium for dysfunction. So here's a little review question actually, kind of trying to get you ready for what you might see on the final exam, what kind of questions you would see there. So, which vitamins and minerals are required as coenzymes or cofactors for the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex? So we already saw that thiamine was involved there. So which other ones do you remember? <coughs> Talking about we get the magnesium portion right. Just shows that you were paying attention. 
legendary the last time in. Magnesium is down, 
the factories are not active. So it's the regulation between the binding of these factories between calcium and magnesium that regulates whether this pathway will exist. Um, in times when you have a high calcium or a low, mag uh, low magnesium intake, you can see how this dysregulation could exist where there would be excess clogging and excess activation of thrombin because there isn't that regulatory or that down regulatory role of magnesium in this pathway. Uh, magnesium also has multiple interactions that we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but one of those which we went over in the transport and uh, absorption part of the physics uh, lecture is the fact that they compete for reabsorption in the kidney and in the intestine as well with the TRMP6. Um, the calcium-magnesium ratio also affects muscle contraction in a similar manner that calcium, the factors in the blood clotting cascade combine both calcium and magnesium. Um, the, the myosin can also bind calcium or magnesium as well, or the myosin kinase. And when calcium is down, it's the myosin complex is active, and this activates muscle contraction. Uh, when magnesium is down, the 